Welcome to Annunciation Radio's Faith with Reasons, the program that examines what the church teaches and why. Faith with Reasons. Well, thank you for joining us on today's edition of Faith with Reasons. Here we are in the fifth week of Lent. Some would call that the home stretch. We've got uh, an amazing week next week with Holy Week. But still, a lot of Lent to get through and uh, even an indulgence, a plenary indulgence available uh, that uh, we can we might be able to spend a few minutes on. But uh, uh, if you haven't done that yet, there's still an opportunity to do that. But we are very excited uh, on today's show to welcome Father Robert Spitzer. That's right, I said Father Robert Spitzer. Father Spitzer's universe, of course, heard here on Annunciation Radio, and uh, you've seen him on TV, you've you've heard him on EWTN, and uh, very uh, pleased that he could clear his schedule to spend an hour with us today uh, here on Faith with Reasons. And uh, we're going to be talking about a, a book that's coming out. Uh, I don't know if it's his 18th or 19th book, uh, The Four Levels of Happiness, which we're going to spend some time on today uh, so that you can look for it and maybe pre-order it because it's going to be available April 16th. But Father Robert Spitzer, SJ, Ph.D., is president of the Magis Center of Reason and Faith and also the Napa Institute. He was president of Gonzaga University from 1998 to 2009, There, he increased the student body by 75%. He oversaw the construction of 20 new facilities and raised $200-plus million for scholarships and buildings. He is the author of 18 books, including the award-winning New Proofs for the Existence of God and, most recently, Science at the Doorstep to God and Science, Reason, and Faith. Discovering the Bible. He's also authored many scholarly articles on faith and science, metaphysics and happiness and ethics, and his weekly show, Father Spitzer's Universe, heard here on Annunciation Radio and seen, of course, on EWTN television. He started seven institutes dedicated to faith and reason, as well as Catholicism and culture, and was a professor at Georgetown University, Seattle University, and Gonzaga University. Father Spitzer was awarded the Teaching Medal at both Georgetown University and Seattle University, and he has held two major academic chairs and has won multiple academic and professional awards, including honorary doctorates, the uh, DeSmet Medal, Gonzaga University's highest award, and the Aquinas Medal for Catholic Philosophical Scholarship. And I'll tell you, Father Spitzer, we're we're very uh, pleased that you could join us today, and uh, with all the work that you do with Faith and Reason uh, we just had to have you on Faith with Reasons here at Annunciation. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sounds like we've got a real complementarity of apostolates here. <laughs> yeah, well, we really we seek to uh, to kind of tell uh, the story of what the church teaches and why it teaches that. And uh, boy, that's in your wheelhouse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, well, I, I, as they say, I've dedicated a good amount of my life to it. But prior to 15, uh, not so much of that part, but since that time, uh, I've been very interested in those questions. And I know that they come up uh, quite frequently. You do a great job on the universe uh, in addressing them. And, uh, you know, you, you think that you, you follow these things and you're kinda, you kind of know what the answers to some of these things are. And then, then you explain it, and it's like I'm learning something every time uh, that I'm listening to the show. So... Uh, thank you uh, for your gift to the church and to Catholic Radio, number one. Oh, I do you. want to talk about the, about the new book that is coming out uh, from Sophia Institute Press, mm-hmm. available April 16th. It's The Four Levels of Happiness, Your Path to Personal Flourishing. What drove you to write this book? Well, I wrote a book on happiness quite a while back <clears throat> called Finding True Happiness. But, I, um, you know, I wanted to produce a popular book, and uh, uh, the good folks at Sophia Press were very interested in working on this popular book on happiness with me, uh, where I could explain not only to Catholics, though surely those uh, good folks, but I just wanted to reach a broader audience, uh, too, of, you know, especially because of our young people, you know, who are trying uh, their their very best to find happiness, in a secular culture which has become increasingly materialistic and filled with ego comparative gratifications and Instagram and, and um, you know, Facebook, etc. And so the thought I had was, um, how can I make a contemporary book 
um, a compelling case, uh, not so much for um, a person who's a convinced Catholic. Uh, I would recommend they read, you know, Finding True Happiness if, you know, if you're looking for that. Although I think this book would be very good even if you are a convinced Catholic, but I think this is good too, not just for the convinced Catholics. I think it is really good for those who basically find themselves pulled more um, significantly into what I would call our secular existence. And we think for a while, you know, that that this is the direction we want to go. But then we find our lives are kind of filled with foreboding and, uh, you know, a sense of emptiness and alienation and loneliness. And we can't figure out, you know, where it's coming from. But really, it's coming from um, our uh, ignoring um, our um, our spiritual uh, constitution, ignoring our spiritual desires. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, I just have a bit of cough. <clears throat> but anyway, it, it sounds, got, that, sounds you know, like you got a little bit of the crud that's been going around yeah, everywhere. <laughs> that's right. So uh, anyway, but uh, so um, make a long story short, um, they. Uh, uh, I just uh, I'm going to do this because uh, I started doing these concepts with younger people, with people who are kind of um, what I would call on the margins Catholics, um, and uh, people who were not to be convinced, you know, uh, by religion. If I went at it straight, but if I talked to them about happiness first, and then brought up the topic of religion as the only way to be completely happy that I could actually do a, a twofer, right? I could get people more interested in religion, get more uh, people interested in true happiness through God, which is the only way they're going to be happy. Uh, you know, Augustine had it 100% correct, for thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. So and I- so... Uh, yeah. Well, I was, I was just going to ask, um, you know, and I think you've, you've answered part of my question exactly how, how you, you, you approach this because it sounds to me, if I understand you correctly, that you're, you're basically explaining the, this happiness or happiness deficiency initially and then, yeah. and then in, in, introducing the religious component to this. Right. So my approach is kind of an Aristotelian one, but it also corresponds with like Maslowian and other psychological approaches like Mas, Abraham Maslow. Um, and also you can um, uh, see this uh, in a lot of philosophers beyond Aristotle and, and um, you know, Thomas Aquinas and Augustine. <clears throat> you know, you'll find it in, you know, uh, Carl Jaspers, Gabriel Marcel, uh, Mach Shaler, um, a variety of, you know, Christian existentialists today uh, all over the place. So, what I did was, uh, you know, these four levels, I'll explain why they're levels in a moment, but, you know, my de- general definition of happiness is Aristotelian, right? Happiness is the satisfaction of a desire, a fundamental of a desire within us, a driver, if I can put it that way, that's within us. And uh, if we don't get it satisfied, we say, oh, we're unhappy, something's unfulfilled. And uh, if we do get it satisfied, then we say, well, you know, we're happy. Uh, at least we're temporarily happy. Um, can't be permanently happy with what I'm going to call level one and two. So I said, if I could just, uh, you know, find the four fundamental drivers or uh, the the major drivers of, of humanity, I can probably find the four kinds of happiness um, and then try to rank them from there. So, uh, you know, I, I turned, of course, to Aristotle and Aquinas, but then I, I you know, uh, like I said, I don't need to, to go to a church source here. Uh, you're going to see this in anthropologists. You're going to see it in psychologists. You're going to see it um, in uh, non-Catholic philosophers. You're going to see it uh, pretty much everywhere, maybe except for Nietzsche. So the, the main <laughs> thing, though, is uh, is if you if you take that seriously, you'll see you got like four desire sets. you got the desires that come from your material um, and uh, being, you know, your Ner- central nervous system, et cetera. Um, uh, we'll call those for a second. Uh, happiness or desires that come from uh, pleasure, right? So you food could give you pleasure. Shelter, if you get a so you give you pleasure. And some form of materialistic adornment. So if you get a nice new uh, pair of clothes, 
you get some, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a Mercedes 500 E class of leather upholstery. You say, <laughs> okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. But you're happy in a very, very low level. Uh, you, you do get some uh, real instant gratification from that. You definitely also uh, get a sort of a, a, a superficial kind of a intense pleasure from that, riding around in the old bends and, you know, eating the bowls of linguine and the Chateau Margot wine, et cetera, et cetera. So you're basically saying, okay, I'm happy, but it's not pervasive, enduring, and deep. It'll never make you permanently happy. It'll never make you deeply happy. It will never make you, it'll leave you empty, alienated, lonely, you know, because so much of you will be unfulfilled. But for, you know, for your good 10-minute linguine jolt, uh, you can get it. I mean, for your second glass of Chateau Margot, you can get it. But it's not a long laster. And, of course, you can't keep indulging that stuff as um, it'll pay you back. So, um, anyway. Yeah, kind of pay it back, <laughs> back in a hurry. <laughs> Don't uh, want to gain too much weight. Yeah, I guess that <laughs> is. Uh, yeah, if the familiar voice of Reverend Dr. Robert Spitzer on mm-hmm. Faith with Reasons today and the Four Levels of Happiness, which is uh, coming out uh, in mid-April. Uh, and uh, just uh, kind of looking at this book, it, you kind of mentioned it, uh, that whatever level uh, dominates our lives kind of dictates our actions and uh, helps determine the depth and endurance of, uh, of, our, of our individual happiness. But in this book, you're, you take us through these levels and you give examples not only from, from the Catholic world, but from science and philosophy and psychology and even from everyday life. Uh, so these are, uh, you're really giving us some achievable ways to get up that ladder of happiness, correct? That's right. That's exactly what I'm trying to do, give concrete examples, and also what are the pitfalls you can run into. But how do you know you have all these desires? So, of course, you have these, what I call materialistic pleasure desires, but you also have ego-comparative desires, right? Who's achieving more? Who's achieving less? Who's got more power, less power, more popularity, less popularity? Who's smarter, who's less smart, more athletic, less athletic, more beautiful, less beautiful? You got the point. I mean, we're constantly out there making comparisons of ourselves to others. We want to see how we uh, hold up. And, of course, if we win, if somebody comes up and says, Spitzer, you are a fantastic chess player and you have achieved much, I come back and say, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. <laughs> and of course, it makes you happy. And, um, and so that's ego comparative happiness. But um, as we shall see in just a moment, though that kind of happiness can give us, um, uh, you know, a, what I might call an ego boost, uh, even a, something that uh, kind of feels like a sense of real euphoria. You know, um, I made it to Harvard. I did this or that or whatever it is that's uh, giving you that boost. The trouble is, again, like with materialistic and pleasure happiness, it's not enough. Um, even though I think, wow, um, you know, at the very front part of the uh, Mensa society, you know, everybody thinks I'm a brainiac, and you say, okay, uh, I'm, I'm really, really happy right now for another five minutes. But then eventually the a- emptiness comes in, loneliness, alienation begins to to sort of come back in there. Even St. Augustine, right? And nobody had a better brain than he is. Yet, you know, he's just thinking there's something missing in life. You know, what's, what am I missing here? What's going on here? And so uh, uh, poor Augustine is, is trying to figure out, you know, um, I, I, I don't know, I should be happy. I should be at the top of my game. I'm like the Jesuits. I, I charge a lot of money for tuition. And and yet you know um you know everybody respects me, but I'm really not happy. I'm left kind of alone. Something's missing. I need some. So he goes, okay, I know what it is. Uh, you know, I should live more for. At that time, he was not married to um, uh, his mistress, who gave him his illegitimate son, uh, Adeodatus, which means, by the way, gift of God. <laughs> um, so, uh, but nevertheless, he says, that's, that must be it. But then he finds out too, well, this gal, she can't make me ultimately happy. And even though I love the heck out of my son, 
He can't make me, uh, you know, ultimately happy. He can't give me all that I need. He can't give me some form of ultimate significance, some hope of eternity. He's a wonderful beloved, right? Beloved of God, you know, and a gift of God. He, he, he knows that, but yet he also knows in the same breath there again, it's not going to do it. I'm going to be left with the emptiness loneliness, alienation, dread, guilt. I'm just going to be left with those same emotions. And that's when, of course, he knows where he's going. Of course, he moves up to the final stage, and he knows he's a transcendent being. Augustine was one of the smartest guys around. Not only had he read Plato, like, from ear to ear, you know, he knows uh, Plato very well, but he also recognizes the profundity of Plato's thought with respect to what we call the five transcendentals, um, the desire and the awareness of perfect truth, perfect love, perfect uh, goodness, perfect um, uh, beauty, and perfect home. So he knows he's got these desires. He knows that he has to have some kind of awareness of these things, at least a tacit awareness of what perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home would be like or might be like in order to desire them. So he's got to have something, something he's desiring. So at least a, a very tacit awareness of, of these things. And so he says, you know, I must have a soul if I have these transcendental desires, which can in no way be encompassed by mere physical processes alone. So I, I, I've got a soul, and not only do I have a soul, and, you know, that makes me aware of these things that I'm desiring. But, you know, where am I going to find perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and hope? Well, as he begins to take out his good platonic roots and, you know, his, uh, um, you know, a Plotinus and other things that uh, um, he's very much aware of in the Neoplatonic tradition, he comes out and says, well, you know, it, it looks like... Um, you know, maybe I not only have the desire for perfect truth, but, you know, he says, he's saying to himself, well, I have a soul that is capable of giving me that. Who could have made me like this? Maybe it was the creator who gave me this soul with this desire. But, and if the creator um, gave me the desires for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home, then, then uh, you know, maybe he is in some way perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. But how many perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and homes can you have, he says. Well, you can only have one, because, of course, anything which is perfect, like perfect truth or perfect love or perfect being, right, it has to be unrestricted, and if it's unrestricted, it has to be one, because you can only have one unrestricted being. So, when you get right down to it, he basically says, for thou hast made us for thyself, mm -hmm. and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. You know, Lord, you made us for yourself. You made us to be satisfied by you alone. You gave us a spark of your transcendency, a spark of your immateriality, a spark of your trans-physical, transcendental um, awareness or knowledge of truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. You gave us every bit of this stuff, and now, of course, our hearts are burning for you, but you left us free. You will, you know, you didn't make it too strong. You didn't mow us down with it. We're going to have to choose that over against the other three desires and over again. So basically going back over it, you're going to have to choose level four over against material, um, you know, increase and, and pleasure increase. So will I have the, you know, can I define my my existence in terms of ice cream cones, bowls of linguine, and Chateau Margot wine. Well, you could try to do that. You'd be horribly unhappy if you did, but you could do that, and that'd be your choice. God's not going to take it away, but you might be like Augustine and go, that isn't going to do it. So then you could go to ego comparative happiness and, and go, you know, I really am at the top of my game. Frankly, I'm the smartest guy I know. <laughs> and you know, I shouldn't say that, but Augustine probably had to know that next to St. Ambrose, he was about the smartest guy he knew. And so, you know, or maybe Plato or, 
something like that, or, or Plotinus, but he's right up there in the in the top five, let's say. He knows he has, a, I mean, he's very humble, but he knows he could have definitely defined his life in terms of that good debater, good teacher, good writer. He knows, you know, he could have gotten quite a secular reputation, and because of that secular reputation, he'd have been incorporated into the Roman Empire's a wonderful system of rewards and things of that nature. And so, but he says, no, that isn't it. I can be the smartest guy in the world. You know, I can be the head of the Mensa Society, but if I'm not living for anything significant, if I'm not making any difference, any positive difference to anybody or anything outside of myself, then I don't care how smart I am. I got to use my intelligence to make a positive difference to somebody or something beyond myself. Otherwise, I'm just a pure empty being, and that's where the emptiness comes from. So what Augustine says, you know, along his journey is, you know, a reason I'm feeling so much emptiness and alienation and loneliness, et cetera, is because I can't just live on my reputation and people clapping for me every time I get out on stage. The only thing... I, I got to be making a difference with my life. I got to be doing something that you know. You know, when I get to the end of my life, I I don't want to go. Hmm. Um, here here I am at eighty years old. Now, what was the difference between the value of my life and that of a rock? And have to say, well, maybe the rock did more for humanity than I did. <laughs> that would be incipient despair. So, of course, you, nobody wants to be thought that I wasted it all. I was, as it were, the life waste guy with all the talents in the world. So uh, Gus, that's not good enough for Augustine. So he moves on to contributive happiness, level three, where he's trying to make a positive difference to, uh, you know, his mom, you know, who's constantly needling him and going after him. And uh, occasionally, you know, Augustine gives his mom the slip, you know, uh, kind of right there on the... Uh, on the shores of Carthage, you know, she turns around and he's already on the boat waving at her as it's pulling off from shore. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then that was Augustine. He, but he loved his mom very much. He tried to make a difference to help her out. He definitely wanted his father to uh, come around after he became a Christian, but at that point he wasn't a Christian uh, when he was leaving his mom behind. He was going to the big city, and so he, uh, he, he you know, kind of uh, leaves her on the shore. But the main thing, though, is um, uh, his his uh, mistress, his illegitimate son, even all those things, it just didn't do it. So finally, of course, it, it occurs to him, you know, the logic of, I've got a soul. I'm meant for transcendence. I've got these transcendental desires that Plato talked about for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. I've, I've got it. It's in me. I, I totally get it. And God alone can produce this and fulfill me. God alone, because you can only have one and only one perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and hope. And once he's got in his mind, he goes, oh, for thou hast made us for thyself. But then Augustine, he wants to run. You know, he he, he likes living a, a rather lustful life. You know, he, he likes his... Uh, Got, he used to have more girlfriends when he got the steady one who was his mistress. He was settling down, surely. But, you know, his old... Uh, line that everybody knows, Lord, please give me the the virtue and the grace of chastity, but not now. Not now, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he's, he's, he's not ready quite yet. He's resisting and so forth, but he knows that this guy, St. Ambrose of Milan, has the answers. And so, you know, slowly but surely, he drifts into conversations um, with St. Ambrose, who is really close to Augustine and brilliance. And of course, as such, Ambrose knows a person like himself. And he's kind of able to walk uh, St. Augustine through the steps. And you get the point. At the end of it, you know, when Augustine gets all the answers, he hated the Old Testament. He just thought, this, this does, you know, whatever you say about Christ, you know, the Old Testament contradicts it. So he was not a um, an Old Testament fan when he was getting started. But as he goes to St. Ambrose 
Ambrose begins to unlock and say, well, you know, that's true. Christ has superseded, you know, these things. And Augustine, you know, you can just see him saying to St. Ambrose, well, what about this one? Moses is telling, you know, the, the people in the conquered lands, don't leave anything alive. Kill all the children. Kill all the animals. Kill the women. Kill them all. And Augustine, you could just see him saying, right, whoa, wait a minute here. What has this got to do with Jesus? And, of course, Ambrose says, well, you're right. You know, Jesus superseded that teaching. But he basically explains that, you know, you know Moses is a product of his time. That, you know, and by the way, um, you know, uh, Pope, uh, uh, well, uh, Benedict, um, before that, though, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, Ratzinger had a very good book on this. Unfortunately, I'm not aware of an English translation, but in German, um, you know, it's basically how do you interpret these seemingly um, uh, difficult passages where Jesus evidently has superseded the Old Testament, um, you know, teachings. And what Ambrose gave to Augustine was, um, you know, probably a more complex version, but I'll give you a Benedict's version. Basically, there's two parts to every single scripture passage. One is called the core message. The core message is inerrant. But, says Ratzinger, the core message is also wrapped in a form. He calls it the external form of the message, the outward form of the message. Now, that outward form is human. It's not divinely inspired. And so when you, um, it can change, right? So if you get your outward form of your message from a warrior culture and you're really worried, I mean, what's the, what's the core of the message? The core of the message is don't go back to Canaanite worship. It'll kill you. That's basically the, the core of the message. Well, what is the, uh, the, <coughs> the outward form of the expression? <coughs> The outward form of the expression is, well, kill the competition. <laughs> so in Moses' way of looking at it, you know, you gotta, you gotta make sure these guys are exterminated so they're not going to pollute uh, your your environment. Now you look at that and you go, that doesn't make any sense in light of Jesus. Absolutely right. <laughs> so Rodzinger says, you don't have to buy that part. You know, Jesus superseded it. Wow. What a fascinating uh, topic and uh, so so rich. And I can't wait to get back on the other side of this break and continue our discussion. Father Robert Spitzer, our guest here on Faith with Reasons on Annunciation Radio, The Four Levels of Happiness, Your Path to Personal Flourishing, available April 16th. The effects of abortion are greater than most people realize. It isolates, hurts families, brings about fear, sadness, and grief. It does not need to separate you from God. If you or someone you know is hurting after an abortion, please reach out to Project Rachel at 419-260-5811 or by going to hopeafterabortion.org. Nothing is too great for God's mercy. Project Rachel is here to offer confidential help on your journey to healing. Jehovah Witnesses argue that Jesus is a lesser divinity than Jehovah because the Greek text in John 1.1 doesn't say the word was the God. The definite article isn't there. As such, they argue it should be translated a God. How do we respond? Well, first, six times in John 1, the term God appears without the definite article. But yet the JWs translate it as a God only once, in reference to the word. Not very consistent. Second, in Greek, the definite article is prefixed to the subject, not the predicate. And in this clause, God is the predicate, and the Word is the subject. Finally, John refers to Jesus as the God in 1 John 5.20, saying, This is the true God. So, be at peace, my Christian friends. You don't have to go to a kingdom hall this Sunday. I'm Carlo Broussard with the ready reason for Catholic Answers. Catholic.com Every weekday afternoon at 3, join us for our live and interactive Divine Mercy Chaplet. Do you have something or someone you're praying for? Imagine the power of hundreds of people praying for your intention. We have several ways for you to share your request. You can visit our app and go to the Prayer Request button, send an email to chapletprayer at gmail.com, or call our Prayer Request line at 419 419- 
1-866-868-2966. Here at Annunciation Radio, we're praying for you. Now, back to Faith with Reasons, here on Annunciation Radio. Hey, welcome back here. Sheen Stainfield with Ron Finn, and today we're very blessed, actually honored to have uh, Father Robert Spitzer on the phone with us, uh, covering his latest book, which is out uh, April 16th, uh, The Four Levels of Happiness, Your Path to Personal Flourishing. Um, Father Spitzer, uh, SJPHD, is president of the Magis Center of Reason and Faith, and also the Napa Institute. And I think Ron spent maybe 10 minutes reading the bio in the first half, so um, you may want to go back and, and listen to all of these. I, I read the, the abbreviated, the abridged version. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I just, uh, we are, we are, and I say truly honored. You've got, uh, you've got a, a, just a, a wonderful, um, a, a credentials here. It's, uh, it's amazing all that you, you've done. And I, I do want to highlight that this is your, your 18th book, I believe. Um, yes. 18th, um, a book that's, uh, which I think is impressive just in itself. So anyhow, I'd like to get back to, uh, uh-huh. uh the, uh, the, the, the discussion because, uh, I believe we left off where it seemed to me that, uh, you know, you've used Augustine as an example here of yeah. um, the openness of one to move beyond the first two levels of happiness and, and to come to recognize the need for, you know, the third and fourth levels of, of happiness in, and, and Augustine pretty much just fought him his way into this. Right. That's right. And uh, it, it's so interesting. Uh, but, you know, you can see Providence is kind of guiding uh, St. Augustine as he's going along. Because, you know, he's got, Providence is guiding him interiorly mm-hmm. because he's never happy. He's never satisfied. Something's missing, and he knows that something is missing. So that's the interior. But as he, you know, casts about and he's looking for solutions, the first thing, you know, when he's moving to that transcendental level, right, he, he definitely wants to uh, to go with some of the old Roman cults, you know, the, the Stoic things and uh, things of that nature. So um, uh, they called the Manichae uh, sect, which was a rather, you know, honestly, it, it had a lot of penance and, and um, you know, a distrust of material things that had a kind of a transcendental aspect to it, but it's taking the whole wrong approach. Uh, it's trying to get to transcendence through a, a hatred of the material. So um, uh, that, uh, um, uh, you know, is, is, is certainly something that, um, you know, Augustine, as I said, he, he begins to figure out that's not the way to go. And uh, But he has to break off from the Manichees, and he sort of has to, he moves back to the Platonic philosophers, and he, well, there's something missing here too. <clears throat> Even though they they think they can prove a a transcendent God, they really, you know, they're, this God is not very personal, is what he notices, and he says, you know, I, I think I've discovered my error. I'm trying to get myself from this world this material world, to God. I need God with us. I need Emmanuel. I need a God who's going to come down here and reveal himself to me. Otherwise, all my attempts to move forward without getting any kind of input from God are just likely to be futile. Mm -hmm. And more than futile, they're... (laughs) They could lead me so far astray that I could destroy my life, <coughs> as even <coughs> with the Manichees. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> sorry. So anyway, long and short of it is that he basically says, "I God, you got to come. You know, got to be with me. You got to come down to me." And of course, Old Testament is inhibiting him from kind of zooming up to Christ and the church. But Ambrose is inviting him. He's he's explaining things to him. And finally, of course, um, Augustine gets it. Um, he, he says, okay, uh, you know, I, I, I get the Old Testament. I see where it's coming from. I see how Jesus superseded some of these things. I, I can see, you know, as um, Pope Benedict would call it, or, you know, Ron Singer would call it, the outward form of the expression, um, you know, could vary and it's be, you know, temporally conditioned because of the human author and the, 
the culture of the human author, etc. So he, he gets it and he says, okay, um, you know, what do I have to do? And again, you got to just keep your eyes out for these little moments of providence. And so two things happen to Augustine that are truly trivial. Yet you look at them and you go, you know, there's something there. And, um, you know, God is is working there. So he hears a little kid, you know, reciting a poem. And he just says, I wonder, you know, if I took the numbers in that poem and, and plugged them into the Bible, I wonder what would be there. And, of course, there's this, you know, passage so relevant to Augustine's point in his in his life transition and so he's going okay okay you know and uh, there's several other things that that happen uh, to him uh, quite providentially and of course his whole life he begins to see it going backwards well the only reason I met Ambrose is because of this and the only reason I got uh, to Milan instead of Rome was because of this and my mother ultimately was responsible for all of this and he, you know, that's when he, you know, finally blurts out his prayer, right? Mm-hmm. Late, late have I loved thee, O beauty ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved thee. So therein lies, you know, Augustine's journey. And um, and um, uh, I can tell you, it's it's a mixture. Augustine has to have the will to move forward. But God is enticing him without compelling him. He's kind of drawing him to himself without pushing him or kind of forcing him or manipulating him. He's always leaving him uh, free to choose. And of course, that's why Augustine became really the big Catholic saint of freedom. Um, And uh, he got the, the doctrine of free will off the ground. So he really, um, he really at this point has just stumbled into the the third and fourth levels of happiness. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, so he's he's definitely moved into the third and fourth level, and of course, when he finds Emmanuel, when he finds God with us in Jesus, that this is exactly what he needs, and of course, he reconciles. Um, he loves Jesus, but he, you know, the Old Testament, as I said, kind of got him. But then when he's got that reconciled, then he goes on and he says, well, you know, do I really need uh, the church? And the answer is unequivocally, yes, because, uh, you know, Augustine's too intelligent. He's too sensitive. He knows. He knows he could rationalize his way through just about anything. Mm -hmm. And he's very honest with himself, but he also knows, oh, you know, I... I, I can just about say anything to benefit myself. If I don't have a, a magisterium, if I don't have somebody guiding me, um, you know, that uh, that's going to be, uh, you know, um, one big, you know, uh, naughty situation. Mm-hmm. And because um, I could just about j- uh, rationalize anything. So he, he goes, you know, to the church and he decides I'm going to I'm going to get baptized. Of course, Ambrose is there uh, to do the honors. But when he goes over the line and becomes baptized, he has a meteoric rise, you know, right to one of the highest bishoprics you can get in the uh, um, in the Catholic Church in the ancient world. So I mean, Carthage is a big deal. So I mean, um, uh, when you and Hippo and and so forth. So you can pretty much get the sense that man, he's the skeptic who stepped over the line, and when he did. Um, as Blaise Pascal would say, he becomes the most ardent of disciples. So, yeah, and we've learned so much, too. Uh, again, our guest is Father Robert Spitzer. You knew that just by hearing his voice uh, from uh, <laughs> Father Spitzer's universe. And the book that's coming out in mid-April from Sophia Institute Press is called The Four Levels of Happiness, Your Path to Personal Flourishing. And I believe it's available now for pre-order. And yep. uh, I, I, I do have a question about these levels in, in terms of uh, mm-hmm. when the reader picks up this book. Uh, we'll want to determine pretty much where we're at on this happiness scale. And mm-hmm. is it possible to, um, to to really have a little bit of more than one level? I mean, I, I could yeah. see, yeah, you, you could have a little bit of each or at least three out of four, um, mm-hmm. but not fulfilled. Yeah, and you could also reverse three and four too 
Hmm. So there's uh, there's both uh, aspects. So you know, for me, I, I'm I was not a one, two, three, four guy, though many many people in this culture are. Uh, they move from one to two to three to four. They discover contributive before they discover transcendent. Uh, me, I knew since the time I was 16 years old how important God was. There was no way I was going to ignore God in my life, and there's no, I knew. If God existed, then that's what matters. Everything else pales by comparison. Whether I go to the football game or not, I don't care. If God exists, that's what I'm living for. If I got, you know, an A plus or an A minus on the test, I don't care. Because, of course, really, it's God who I'm living for. And so I knew, I, I knew if God existed, this is a big deal. So I went from one, I decidedly went to two. I mean, I was Mr. Ego comparative. They put in my yearbook, you know, <laughs> doesn't suffer fools gladly. So, I mean, I definitely went that direction. And I, I was kind of arrogant, admittedly. And then, um, you know, but I zoomed up to four after two because I just knew. I just, if God exists, then this is the meaning of life. This is where I'm going. So I zoomed up to four and pretty much began uh, going to daily mass when I got to college, um, and then um, that really transformed me. But then I got interested in the scriptures. Then I got interested in philosophical apologetics, you know. And even though I liked math and I liked business and I liked all these other wonderful things that I, could, you know, could could be satisfied and happy with, um, you know, I uh, I basically thought, hmm, you know, maybe. Uh, Maybe I, uh, I, uh, I would like to uh, do something more religious with my life, and um, and so I began to really entertain the thought, you know, well maybe I should do something on a religious level, and then of course I go, no, no, you know, Dad has given money to his alma mater, which was Harvard, you know, to maybe help grease the skids. Dad has put in a word for Dad's law firm. You know, they're expecting that I will uh, someday take over, and I felt very pressured in some ways. Not by any, uh, not his will. Dad never wanted to pressure me, not for a single second. But it was there, and I knew it was there. And so, of course, I had to make this decision. So I said, Mom, how am I going to do both of these things? And my mom says, you're never going to believe it. I've just been reading this Time Magazine article, and it's about the permanent diaconate. I said, what are you talking about? I've never heard of it. Well, yeah, just make sure that you, um, you know, uh, get married before you uh, get ordained to the diaconate, and you can do both. You can take over your dad's law firm, you can get married and have a family, and you can do all these uh, diaconate things as well. You know, this is the way for you to go. I thought, that that does it. So I thought, Whew. okay, I don't have to make that decision anymore. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Well, of course, as, you know, just a, an Augustine moment, I mean, you know, I was going to daily mass, I was leaving St. Aloysius Church, and out of the corner of my eye, I catch this brochure called On Being a Priest. And half of my brain said, oh, read that brochure. The other one, part of my brain said, no, don't, don't read that brochure. So I'm going back and forth, and finally I said, I'm picking it up. And I started reading through that brochure. And it wasn't like some convincing argument. Half of the brochure was pictures of doing this and doing that and, you know, saying mass or priest activities or, you know, it was kind of like a, a almost something written for about an eighth grader. But I was very intrigued by it. You were being nudged. I was being nudged and... <laughs> The Holy Spirit was going, yeah, yeah, that's you inside of my heart, and but he not not pushing, but just sort of saying, wouldn't you like that? And of course, everything inside of me saying, yes, I, I would want to be a, a priest like that. I, I I would, you know. And then uh, I, I, to complete the story, it'd take me another ten minutes, which I won't waste any time on. But basically, that was the turning point. I. Finally went back to my mom and I said, no, the permanent diaconate isn't that for me. I'm, I'm going to go all the way. Mm -hmm. And if I'm wrong, then I'll bail. 
um, you know, um, and then a vish hit or something, and and then um, you know, I'll I'll go back to law school and you know, um, or go to law school. I haven't gone to law school yet. Um, I was, but I'll I'll go to law school and uh, take over the the firm. So um, anyway, long and short of it was, everything I did was like stepping into consolation. It was just like Augustine. Walk with me. Come along this way. And then I'd find Father Steckler, and then I'd find some other priest, you know, Father Buser. And then I would, you know, there were, you know, I went to the Spain program. Oh, my gosh. That program was, uh, you know, sponsored by Triumph Magazine. But, you know, I had, uh, you know, Josef Pieper, um, Bertrand de Margerie. I, I, I had all these fantastic professors in the Spain program. And you remember good old Warren Carroll, uh, you know, the historian and yeah. all these guys. I mean, it was just like, wow, I was the luckiest guy in the world. And of course, for someone like me who needs to get his concepts put together, it was like I got, uh, you know, drinking from a fire hydrant. I, <laughs> I couldn't stop. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, when I got out of there, I was more convinced than ever. And my buddy, Mike Patton, uh, now a judge in Washington, but he uh, he t- he was the one who said you ought to go to this program. It'll do you a lot of good. Mm-hmm. And old Mike was right on the marker, mm-hmm. almost as if he were, you know, literally operated by the Holy Spirit to say that to me. But it all worked out great. I I have to tell you, I I've never really been unhappy since. Wow. And Joseph Pieper, um, with uh, all that he's written, I mean, I've read a lot of uh, of what he's written about the virtues. Oh, so yeah. It sounds like a, a pretty well-rounded uh, program. Now, oh. Father, as a, as a Jesuit, um, uh, what do you draw from uh, Ignatius of Loyola's rules of discernment? Yeah, you really should put a decision like that uh, into those rules. Now, at the time, I didn't even know what those rules were. I I remember just sitting there going, I guess I better go to Father O'Leary, who was the uh, vocation director. Probably had to go to him and just tell him what I'm thinking. So I went to Father O'Leary, and and he said, are you the one that started that Lagos newspaper? I said, oops, you know, yeah, that was me. (laughs) You know, he goes, kind of conservative. I said, well, I I, I guess so. You know, but uh, I said, I I really do think I've got a call from God. He goes, well, how long have you been thinking about this? Well, I said, I've been thinking about it for quite a while, sort of at the back of my mind, but right in the forefront of my mind, two, three weeks, he bursts out laughing. (laughs) He just thinks, he says, you've made a decision like that. I said, you know, I I really have. I'm, I'm, you know, like I said, I had it in the back of my mind for quite a while, and now I'm kind of ready to go, and yeah, I, I think I'm, I, I've got a, a real conviction here. And so he uh, he says, well, what do you know about the vows? I said, well, uh, there's poverty, chastity, and obedience. He goes, well, what do you think of chastity? I said, well, that's being chased for God. And he said, what do you think of poverty? I said, that's being poor for God. Obedience, same thing. And he goes, anything more? I said, not, not not right at this moment, you know, but, you know, become like Christ, kind of. And uh, that was all I could eke out. I, I had no idea what he was get, getting after, you know. <laughs> so, of course, he says, you got to read all these books. So he piles five books on uh, on my desk on, in front of me. And one of them's the autobiography of St. Ignatius of Loyola. <laughs> and as you know, even though, uh, he doesn't articulate all the rules for discerning uh, spirits as he does in the spiritual exercises. In that autobiography, there are three really major rules about making decisions in times of desolation, how the evil spirit operates. You know, he's there, you get a short-term pleasure, but in the long term, you feel that emptiness and that loneliness, that foreboding, et cetera, et cetera, when you're investing in what's not worthy of you. So at the end of the day, you know, I began to read this book. I and I had two reactions. Number one, I like this guy. Uh, this, you know, he's an action guy. You know, and and you know his three questions about the majus. You know, the even more is what majus means. And of course, is the first thing is is 
what's the greatest universal need? Once you identify, I thought it was faith and reason. Then the second thing is, is anybody else doing it on, on a level um, that, that, you know, is significant in the Catholic Church? And, of course, if, if you could do something, you know, like if you, if you think you could fill in something that's not being done, then, says Ignatius, if you really have that capacity, and it really is a need that the Church really requires, then get off the old duff and get going. And so the uh, objective for me, I looked at that and I said, yeah, that's the way I feel. You know, you identify the need, you see whether anybody else is doing it, and then you look at whether you can do what people are not doing, and if you can, get going. So I just thought, okay, this is, um, I like this guy. Mm -hmm. And of course, later on, when I began to see the rules for the discernment of spirits and a million other things that he has in the spiritual exercises, you know, Ignatius is not an academic like me. Um, he, he was not. He was a soldier. He was an action guy. You know, definitely the kind of guy. Uh, he was a dueler too, and he was a ladies' man, and oh, and any of those things. You know, um, and uh, you know, I was lucky to have a couple of girlfriends in college. You know, and <laughs> certainly not a dueler. You know, so. Uh, but whatever it was that drew me to him, I think it was his pure and simple trust in God. Number one and number two, he wanted to do the majus. He wanted to do everything he could to advance the kingdom of God with the time, talent, and energy that God had given him. And that that just galvanized me. And of course, all the specific rules for the discernment of spirits, I then was able to implement when I did the long retreat, um, the 30-day uh, silent retreat in the novitiate. So it's um, it, it's I guess to summarize your 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 progression here, you went from one to two, and then you said you went right to four, and you were at four. Yeah. But you, you, it seems to me that you know as as your life progressed, um, you became a priest, and of course you've you've mm-hmm. got pages of 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 of, of a bio here, <laughs> yeah. um, amazing accomplishments. It seems to me that you found happiness by going backwards into the contributive yeah, level. Free. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. obviously you found happiness in all you've done. I mean that your success oh, yeah. says that. Oh no, a- absolutely. And in fact, I forgot to mention that very important point. I mean. Once I was skyrocketing in level four, you know, it just became apparent to me more and more. The first thing that became apparent was in in the Jesuit novitiate, you teach catechism a lot. Mm -hmm. So we were sent down, you know, to teach catechism. And I looked at these young people and I knew what I have to say they need. And so it was just evident to me and I began to teach it. And, um, you know, I... I have several stories of this even before I got into the novitiate, but I, I can tell you, I, you know, one time I was, I actually put the Friedman equations on the blackboard as the kids were coming in, a group of male, you know, boys, yeah, I think ninth, tenth grade boys, they're all filing in, they're looking at this equation, they're going, wait, is this the catechism class? I say it certainly is. Uh, have a seat, and of course they go. Uh, Oh, this is unusual. I said, yes, it, it's very unusual. It needs to happen more office, often. So anyway, the, the kids are dying to know what's this equation there for. So I said, if this equation is true, then, you know, everything in our universe proceeds back to a singularity in the finite past. And if that's true, then there was a beginning. And if there was a beginning and the universe is all there is, now we, you know, consider multiverses and stuff, for which there's very good answers. But I said, then then there is a creator, and here's why. So, of course, all of a sudden, these kids who'd never taken out a sheet of paper <laughs> ever <laughs> to take notes in a catechism class, go, who is that guy again? Who's Friedman? You know, so forth and so on. What's this all about? You know, and, of course, they wanted the evidence. And the minute I pulled that stuff out, oh, my gosh, they were on it like bees on honey. And so... Um, uh, really, uh, it, it, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. And this little guy, shortest guy in the class, he comes running up to me afterwards. He goes, are you going to be our catechism teacher for the rest of the year? And I wasn't planning on doing this, 
But these words came from my mouth. Yes, I will. And, of course, they were all kind of cheering and happy, and I thought, well, uh, now I've done it. <laughs> I put my uh, my foot into my mouth, and uh, I rang the bell, and now I made the promise, and I'm going to fulfill it. And ever <laughs> since then, I never really turned back. I mean, the contributive was a real open door to me, especially for kids. I, I just have a deep, deep feeling for for young people. Well, that's wonderful. Now, it seems to me, and I know we've just got a couple minutes left, but I can see how our culture will fuel um, the, the vast majority of people to be, simply be stuck in the first couple of levels. And of course, oh, yeah. the third and fourth level doesn't mean anything to them because they're they're not exposed to anything beyond the instant gratification and the and the ego. Mm-hmm. But it, it, interestingly enough, it seems as though that, that somebody will just say, quote unquote, stuck in level three and four because they've they've found a true happiness level one and two doesn't mean anything to them well it could mean something like for example i need some level one satisfactions i mean every once in a while i love going over to a bunch of friends houses and eating a steak Mm -hmm. and every once in a while i you know i i obviously am going to have to have some credentials to go and open doors to do speeches at universities or something of that nature. Mm-hmm. So you're going to have to have some cred, some esteem <coughs> in order to do that. So the main thing <coughs> is to, you know, remember, you know, you just don't want to make these things an end in themselves. And, yes. Mm-hmm. But if they are a means to getting to something that will really do something uh, to help people or to, you know, grow the kingdom of God, then it's really worth it. Great point. Thank you. The Four Levels of Happiness comes out from uh, Sophia Institute Press on April 16th. If you just can't wait, uh, you could get Finding True Happiness, uh, which uh, he wrote back in 2015. That's available as well. Father Robert Spitzer, it's been a joy having you on and an education. Could we ask you for your blessing? Absolutely. And may Almighty God bless you and send His Holy Spirit down upon you to inspire, guide, and protect you so that everything you do and say will be brought to fruition in His will for the good of His people, church, and kingdom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you.